Good morning again, if I didn't get a chance to say it to you earlier outside or during the announcements. My name is Aaron, and it's my joy to get to bring God's Word for you today as we continue our series that we were calling Covenant, this journey through the Old Testament. Every fall, we begin at the beginning of the Bible and start our way through the Old Testament, and then in the spring, through the New Testament, into the epistles. And every year, we journey through all of Scripture and follow different threads, different themes that are shot through all of God's Word. And this year, we are starting with paying attention to the covenants, the promises and commitments that God makes to his people and the response that he asks back from them. And you've heard over the last several weeks, if you've been here with us, about God's covenant to Noah and to all humanity and all of creation through Noah. The promise never to punish all of the world again for sin, but instead God takes into himself in the person of Jesus Christ the full penalty of sins. And to this day, God has kept that promise to us. Amen? Then he makes a promise to Abraham. He tells Abraham he's going to have many descendants and that through these descendants and the blessing that the seed of Abraham, the blessing that the descendants of Abraham carry, all the world will be blessed. Today we focus on Joseph who does not receive a covenant, a new promise from the Lord, but instead is the recipient of that same promise. The promise that God made to Abraham is handed off to Abraham's son Isaac, and from Isaac to Jacob, and from Jacob to Joseph. And so today we see not a new covenant, but instead we see God's covenant faithfulness to Abraham and through Abraham to his great-grandson Joseph, to whom God is present, who God favors, who God blesses, and to whom God keeps the promise. However, you just heard the same story that I did, right? Does that sound like a person who carries a promise and a blessing? Just in case you zoned out or don't know the broader story, actually Joseph is the largest section of the book of Genesis. His story takes up more chapters than any other portion. God spends less time telling us about the creation of all things than he tells us about the story of Joseph. It's an important story in the scriptures. And it's a story of struggle. Joseph is born into privilege. He is a favored son in the household of Jacob, who is blessed and favored by God. But then his brothers betray him, and then they beat him, and then they imprison him in a hole in the ground, and then they sell him into slavery. Do you see the downward trajectory of Joseph's life? And then it tells us he is taken down into Egypt. The the direction is even right there in the text if you look at Genesis 39. He's taken down into Egypt where he is put into slavery. And then in slavery, he is assaulted by the wife of the man who has bought him. And then in addition to being assaulted by her, he's falsely accused and he's put into prison. And then if you continue reading the story, after he spends some time in prison, he blesses the people that are around him just like God promised he would. And one of those people leaves prison and goes to be a cupbearer in the court of Pharaoh. And now Joseph has a friend next to the king, but it tells us in the scriptures that this friend forgets Joseph. And he is left in prison for two years, forgotten and alone. He goes from favored to betrayed, to beaten, to imprisoned, to sold, to assaulted, to falsely accused, to imprisoned, to forgotten. And yet he is blessed? Does this reckon with how you usually use the word blessing? how you would typically think of the favor of God? If I asked you, what do you see someone and think, wow, they're really blessed? How many of you would think, yeah, usually I would think that means they have a lot of material possessions. Anybody ever think about blessing in your own life or the life of someone else? Nobody in this room, really? You're all holier than me? How many of you might think about blessing coming in the form of physical health, longevity of life, this kind of thing? How about blessing in terms of family or love or relationships? We have a tendency to use the word blessing, whether we see someone else's life and think, wow, they're really blessed, or someone asks us how we're doing, and we say, you know, I've been so blessed, let me tell you about what God's provided, or my family, or my health. Or we scroll through Instagram and see hashtag blessed, and usually it's like a person on vacation on the beach. It's usually a good thing, right? Not too many people would look at the totality of Joseph's life, the story of his perpetual downward trajectory, and say, look at that guy who went from favored to betrayed to beaten to imprisoned to sold into slavery to assaulted to falsely accused to imprisoned and then forgotten, hashtag blessed, right? So what gives? Does God break his covenant with Abraham by betraying Joseph and leaving Joseph alone in a prison? 
by letting all these bad things befall Joseph? Does blessing and favor actually mean, according to a biblical understanding of how God works, that we are only going to experience good, happy, positive things in this life? Well, the resounding answer of all of Scripture, and particularly Genesis 39, is no, absolutely not. And did you see in the text how it lays out? It almost is like an episode of the TV show, The Office. Anybody an Office fan in here? You have permission to go watch a YouTube clip later if you need to. But oftentimes in the show, The Office, there'll be something playing out that's very uncomfortable, awkward, comedic in some way. And it plays out like it's very normal. And then it'll cut to a shot of Jim, who's kind of the straight man in the show, just looking straight at the camera and going like, kind of a what sort of face, you know? That's sort of what happens in this story. Did you notice it? The beginning of Genesis 39, we're told that God is with Joseph in slavery. And you would assume that his being with Joseph and bringing him success in whatever he does would include not being assaulted and then falsely accused. And yet, that's exactly what happens. We're told that God is with Joseph, favors Joseph, is blessing Joseph, and then Joseph has three terrible things in a row happen to him, ends in prison, and then the story tags on, and the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he does. So there is something about how God works to bring favor and blessing. There's something about God's way of keeping the covenant that is surprising to us, that is different than the way we are used to thinking about blessing. And that's because the notion, the notion that if I'm good, God will love me and therefore give me good things. Or if I am going through a hard time, it must be that I have done something wrong to deserve this. Like Job in the Bible, his friends tell him just that. They come to him and they say, Job, you are suffering, your family has died, you're sick, you've lost everything. You probably messed up somewhere, and God's smacking you on the wrist, right? This seems to be the notion of favor and blessing that both Potiphar and the prison guard, who are pagans, are able to see. They see good things happen when Joseph is in charge. Joseph lives an upright, righteous life, and good things happen even as bad things happen to him. But they're able to see that, and they think to themselves, he must be in the favor of the gods because good things happen to this man. I want you to see how that normal notion that goodness equals blessing, and that if I have good things, God must be happy with me, and if I'm struggling or hurting, God must be unhappy with me, is a lie and a pagan bit of theology. And yet it has permeated the church all too often. When my son was diagnosed with arthritis, I actually had someone who, come, who came and wanted to pray with me tell me if we would just believe hard enough, he would be healed. That his healing was already accomplished in Jesus Christ, and if we would just believe it, then we could receive it. And my son's ankle stayed broken. And so what that must have meant is there's something wrong with me, right? It discourages us to be told these lies that if I want to receive more financially, all I have to do is give a little bit to some TV preacher and I'm going to get tenfold back. If I want to receive healing or blessing, all I have to do is believe a little harder. If I was just sinning a little less, maybe that bad thing wouldn't have happened to me. This is pagan theology. It's a lie. It discourages us and it distorts our picture of the God of the Bible. The God of Joseph, of Jacob, of Isaac, of Abraham, of Jesus is a God who works differently than we would expect, who is with Joseph even in the midst of his suffering, who is working through a situation that to all other eyes looked like a curse and looked like failure, and who was faithful beyond the season of suffering in Joseph's life. Instead of having a pagan view of blessing and curse that just translates all good things must be blessings, must be the favor of God, and all bad things must be curses, must be my fault, must be that God doesn't love me, that God's angry with me. Instead, what we see is a picture of a God whose covenant faithfulness persists even when the circumstances, even, with the battle, even when the battle with sin, even when sickness seems to be telling a different story than the covenant story that God is writing. Joseph, in his downward trajectory, continues to experience and to carry with him the covenant promise, the blessing and the favor of God. And so do you, friends, and so do I, through our faith in Jesus Christ in seasons where we're struggling, where we're suffering, where we're sick, where we're dying. In seasons where nobody would look at our lives and say, wow, hashtag blessed, God is with us in it. He is working through it, and he will be faithful beyond it. And that's what I want to point out to you today. That's what I want to encourage you with today. So the first thing I want you to write down in your journals or just try to remember and reflect on this week is just like with Joseph, in our lives, when we can't see what God is doing, when we are experiencing suffering and hurt, know this, 
that God is with us in it. I don't know what your it is, what your suffering, what your challenge, what your battle with sin, what your hardship and setback is. But know this, it is not a curse from God, it is not because you have not had enough faith. Sometimes our sin has natural consequences. It's not that we never bring some things upon ourselves, we certainly do. But that does not mean that every bad thing that happens is a result of God's absence of favor. If you have turned to Jesus Christ in faith, he has promised, he has committed himself to you, and he is with you in it. We're going to pretend to be a little Pentecostal this morning and turn to our neighbor and say that. Would you do that with me? Turn to somebody beside you or say it to yourself if you're more comfortable under your breath, just quiet if you need to, and say, look them in the eyes and say, God is with you in it. Ready? Go. That's, that's pretty good, actually. I got to tell you, I have a tendency sometimes to think that the traditional service is going to be the least boisterous, uh, but you guys just crushed Mill Run, so <laughs> well done. Yeah, well done. I had to really get on their case. I, I feel like you believed what you just said. Maybe some of you have lived through seasons where you can say, yeah, I know I was struggling. Nobody thought I was blessed, but God was with me in it. Well, I want to read to you a portion of Romans 8. See, these themes, these covenants, it's not just that in this one moment, this is what happens with Joseph and I'm making up something out of this one chapter. All of Scripture testifies to this theology of who God is and how God works. And Paul says it really plainly in Romans 8. Hear these words. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now notice, those are all things that Paul expects to happen to Christians right? It's not you're going to be so blessed that you're never going to experience tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword. He says, no, no, faithful Christians, you are going to encounter these things, but who will separate you from the love of Christ when you're in the midst of them? Paul is saying God is with you in it. He says, as it was written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter, but no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That has been the testimony of the Christian church throughout countless centuries of persecution and suffering on behalf of the gospel. That was the testimony of Joseph, who every step of his downward journey into suffering, punishment, and what looked to all the pagan world as cursedness, God was with him every step of the way. Last week after I shared this sermon, someone came up to, up to me after the service and wanted to share their testimony of God being with them in a season like this. They were in the midst of a surgery and then a post-surgery recovery where their pain level got to like an 11 on the 10 scale. And it turned out that out loud in in the room, physically, they were actually screaming for hours in pain until the pain got managed. But he testified to me that in his mind and in his spirit and his heart, he had experienced it as Christ being very present to him, holding him and comforting him. So while out externally he was screaming, his recollection, his memory of that moment is not four hours of suffering, but is God's comfort and closeness. And then when he said he told people about this, that God showed up in the, ho- the hospital room in a way that he hadn't experienced before. Everyone's assumption, everyone jumps to, oh, and then you stopped hurting? And he was able to say, no, no, no. Uh, apparently the pain continued. My wife told me I was screaming for hours. But God was with me in it. Do you see this? Have you experienced this? Our suffering is different. Our battle with sin is different. Our sickness is different. Because we know that our God has promised that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ that is ours when we turn to faith and enter the waters of baptism and receive all that Jesus has for us. We will travel through seasons like this. We absolutely will. Many of you might be right now or people you love are. These times come. But Paul tells us, Joseph shows us, all of Scripture testifies that God is with us in it. But he's not just with us in it, like a passive observer watching us suffer and comforting us emotionally while we struggle in this life. He's also working through it. So turn to the person beside you and tell them, God is working through it. Good job. Good job. God is working through it. Now, did you, did you notice, did you notice in Joseph's story, people made independent choices. At no point in the text does it tell us God caused these things to happen. In fact, in Genesis 50, 20, 
Joseph will get us, give us a bit of theology for making sense of suffering that I go back to all the time when I'm talking to people who are dealing with challenging seasons. Joseph has an opportunity to reconnect with his brothers, his brothers who betrayed him, beat him, imprisoned him, and sold him, and then sent him on that trajectory downward into suffering. And he comes before those brothers, and now he has power. It turns out at the end of the story, Joseph is discovered in prison to have the gift of interpreting dreams. And so the Pharaoh needs a dream interpreted, and Joseph gives a good interpretation, and Joseph ends up at the right hand of Pharaoh. He's the third most powerful person in the empire. And his brothers in Israel come to him because in a time of famine, Joseph has stored away food. And through Joseph and his wisdom, Egypt is blessed and Israel is blessed. And God does his work in this season, in this time and period in history. But Joseph has an opportunity now when his brothers come to receive food to do everything back to them that they did to him. To punish them, to shame them. But what he says to them in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 is beautiful. He says this. What you intended for evil, God used for good. Now notice that both of those verbs really, really matter. The person that sinned against Joseph, his brothers, they really intended it for evil. God didn't trick them. God didn't puppet them into doing evil. They really meant evil, and Joseph really suffered. It doesn't take away the suffering like sometimes we say, oh, God's got a plan, so stop crying, you know? No, keep crying, know that God is with you, brokenhearted about the suffering, but that that suffering will not be wasted in the hands of your sovereign God. That God will take the evil and wickedness that you bring upon yourself, that others put upon you, the brokenness that is just in our sin-sick world, and God will use it for good. Did you see what Joseph did in Potiphar's house and then in prison? He kept getting put in charge of the household. Did you notice that? And then God will bring Joseph into the season of being at the right hand of Pharaoh. And what will Joseph's job be? To oversee the household of Egypt. God prepared him in Potiphar's house with a little bit and then in prison with a little bit more and then puts him at the right hand of Pharaoh for a season of famine to provide for the people of God to keep the promise that God made to Abraham to bless Joseph and through Joseph to bless the nations. God was preparing him, training him, building him up, even in the midst of his experience of suffering. And it tells us in chapter 39, a very important detail in the text, that when he was thrown into prison, Joseph wasn't just put into any prison. He was put into the prison where the king's prisoners were kept. His suffering, his downward trajectory, the evil and wickedness of the people around him led Joseph into proximity to the seat that God had ordained for him. God was working through all of that downward trajectory, and he's doing that in my life, and he's doing that with you as well. It tells us in Hebrews that God uses our suffering as discipline, as training, as cultivating our souls, our character, our virtue, and our hearts for Christian life in this world and for eternity in heaven. God is working through it, and he's with us in it. Real evil, real sin breaks the heart of God, and yet he will not let anything go to waste. He is working through it. And then finally, he is faithful beyond it. He's faithful beyond the season of suffering. It would actually be bad news if what we found in Scripture was that God just never intended to actually bring good when he says that you're blessed. If you're being blessed, you're being favored, you're carrying the covenant promises of God, simply meant that God was with you in your suffering and using your suffering, but there was no actual solution to sin, sickness, death, and evil. If there was no way that it was actually done away with once and for all in your life and in the world, this would not truly be good news. But just like in Joseph's story, God is faithful beyond it, beyond the season of suffering. There is this downward trajectory in Joseph's life, and then there's a turning point. And God is faithful beyond the suffering and brings Joseph into a season where God is blessing him and blessing others through him in ways that we can recognize as blessing, even while he was blessed all the way down as well. Does that make sense? You're tracking that? God is faithful beyond that season of suffering to bring about what God has promised, and that is true for us as well. Even if our story, our journey with sickness and suffering, and it will, ends in death, we Christians look at the grave and say, the grave is not the end of the story. God is faithful beyond it. And so there are times, like my friend who shared that testimony with me about the hospital last week, 
where he got to look on the backside of it still in this life and go, you know what? God was with me in it. He was working through it, and he's been faithful beyond it. Now I'm getting healthier. He is working in my life, and I'm using that testimony to, to tell others about the goodness of God. He gets to see it in this life. Does that make sense? And then there are other times where we don't get to see it in this life, but the church rallies around at a funeral and says and declares over people who have gone into the grave, the grave does not win. Oh, death, where is your sting? God is faithful beyond it. We look forward to a day promised in Revelation 21 with no more sickness, no more crying, no more death, no more tears, no more pain, because God will comfort us and put an end to evil once and for all. God's covenant promise to us is a funny thing to the world. We will not always look blessed to outside eyes, but in the midst of our sickness, our struggles, our suffering, our battles with sin, God is with us in it. He is working through it, and he'll be faithful beyond it. Praise be to God. Amen? So thankful for our God who keeps this covenant who extends Abraham's covenant through the gift of faith in Jesus Christ to all those who call upon the name of Jesus. For all of us who battle and struggle, that promise stays true. God is with you in it today. He's working through it today. He'll be faithful beyond it in this life or the life to come. So we're gonna take just a moment to have Alan's gonna play a little bit of instrumental music for us and just give us some time of reflection and prayer. If you've got something that weighs heavy on your heart, whether it's your own story, your own struggle, or the struggle of someone you dearly love, I want you to just have some time to bring that to the Lord. And ask God through the work of the Holy Spirit to give you the faith to see and to believe that he is with you in it. Maybe to start to understand how he might be working through it. And the hope to know that he is faithful beyond it. As Alan plays, just take a moment to reflect. You can write, you can pray, and then we'll pray together at the end. <laughs> 
Father, we bring before you these concerns, these struggles, these battles, these hurts, our own and those of uh, the people we love dearly, those of the world around us that seems so broken. And I pray, Lord, simply for the gift of faith, for all those in the room who maybe haven't even yet turned to Christ in faith, that you might give the gift of faith and the gift of repentance to turn away from a life led on our own and instead to a life guided and comforted and cared for by you, available to us in Jesus. For those of us who have been walking with you for a long time, Lord, would you give us remembrance of when you have been faithful to us and faithful in the midst of seasons of struggle? And would you give us hope now in whatever it is that we face? Would you give us living hope, as Romans 8 describes, hope that is not seen but that is known because of the promise of your word? that you are working all things for the good of those who love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.